So I see here, uh, looking at stanza one, I see a pregnant woman. Um, basically in stanza two, she's carrying this pregnancy. She's hopeful. She is really hoping that this child will grow up to be, um, you know, some someone respectable in life. We see that in stanzas two and three. We see in stanza two that he had no father. So the father is absent, which is, it's actually a very common reality in, not just in the world, but in the Caribbean particularly. In stanza four, we see that the woman is frustrated, distraught because her son, now grown up, maybe a teenager, maybe a young man, he's working for maybe a criminal and she's angry with this man for hiring her son. But I guess she should also be angry with her son for you know, seeking employment with such a man. In the last, in the second to last stanza, the woman basically starts praying and crying. She realizes that she can't do anything about this situation. In the last stanza, she absolutely gives up, I believe. And she puts herself in the position of the mother of Judas and the mother of the thief on the left hand side of the cross. Both of these people are or were criminals, infamous criminals. So she's saying, well, my son is no better than, than these people. So that's basically what I think is happening, literally. Do we have any, any other ideas of, of what's going on? Did I miss anything? Is there anything we should pay attention to? This is where I can just jump in, unmute your mic and give some ideas. We're trying to learn from, from everyone. Sir? Here. Yes. Sir, I think it, it comments on the fact that a lot of um, male youth die to senseless violence. I think it makes a comment on that. So it, it definitely touches on that theme, violence, particularly gun violence. Maybe you can stretch it to say gang violence, but we're not sure. And it definitely is is circling around that, that topic. But you, you mentioned that um, young men often you know, fall, find themselves in this kind of trap. But is this young man in the poem dead? Does he die in the poem? Sir, it hasn't think? been explicitly stated. Hasn't been explicitly stated. Do we have clues no, that he's either dead or alive? Uh, I think there's a hint that he's alive. And based on the mother said, she said she has no power over you. And this, at this, at the level of earth, what she has are prayers and a mother tears. And as needs it, she used them. She's uh, at the part that she stated that she went to buy the block or something like that. I don't remember where though. Yes, I think it's a fourth stanza. She went downtown and was three and one third yards of block cloth and a deep crown and field that for the day you drop salary. His bloody, his bloody salary might be his death or is, is death, right? Yes. So I guess that is where he entered that. He was still alive. But you know, he might die by what he's doing. I I actually completely agree. He is not yet dead, but the mother is saying, ah, uh, he's going to die soon anyway. So I might as well just buy the casket from now. Because this is hopeless. Right. Do you have any ideas as to what's going on in the poem? Just at the literal level. Anyone can jump in. In my point of view, the mother is saying that basically if you live by the gun you will die by the gun so she's planning for what's about to happen i think so like it's still like the son is going to die because you know how a cross does you slowly die by a cross by like you know bleeding out if the person is on a cross they haven't died yet so since in the last stanza she's talking about how the son is of the thieves on the cross they haven't died yet but like you know going and die like well soon it's an interesting point. <laughs> he might be on his death, I wouldn't say deathbed, but he might be bleeding out or he might be nearing death, even in a more literal sense than, than we initially imagined. You make the comparison with, with the thief on the cross, so we know he's going to be dying soon, that thief. So that, that's an interesting take. Any yeah, other takes? Actually, sure. I actually find that very insightful. From, that's from Jarrell? Yes. Yeah, because yeah. I mean, I've taught this poem a number of times, and I've actually this is the first time I'm getting that connection. Same. In terms of, um, you know, that last answer, and um, 
the vision of him on the cross and uh, represents in his approaching death. So he's being compared to the thief on the cross, but I'm wondering, is he also being compared to Jesus in this poem? Does anyone see that comparison? Not necessarily, but in a sense, he's trying to do that. And also, I think the mother feels like she has somehow failed him because she's saying that he's basically grown up now and she has no power over what he does. But he's still her son, so she still has to prepare herself mentally for what's going to happen. As Sandra, um, she, she said she raised him twice. One, once as a mother, then as a father. I think this part of the stand, this part of this stand up poem is comparing to like the mother in Caribbean, where there are a lot of persons, where there are a lot of sons being raised without fathers. Yes, definitely. So we, we have jumped to stanza three, which is a short and spicy um, stanza. She raised him twice. We know that this is a metaphor, basically saying that she, she played the role of both a mother and a father. So what about the, um, what parenting style do we think this woman had toward her son? Single parent. Single parent. How did she raise the son? Was she, was she strict? Was she loving and kind? What do we think based no, on sir. that? No, sir. I think a bit mind. of both to give him the balance of both a mother and a father. Because she said that she raised him twice, both as a mother and as a when father, she... right? So I think she gave him like a bit of both to equalize it, to make right. it balance. Right. So and when she could not be that... soft, she gave him tough love which was what, where the father, the father part would have came in. And when he needed to be pampered, she would have pampered him. Sure. So he got a balance of both sides. And we can see that she tried her best with him and she tried to put in her all because um, he could have been a doctor or a healer, a politic wings. She had dreams for him. All right. So yeah, basically she raised, she raised him twice, once as a mother. But look at the word then. I think this is an important word. Once as mother, then as father. So basically, the maternal parenting style failed. She tried to take that motherly approach, maybe cuddling him, being too kind, too nurturing. And, you know, being a mother, maybe she didn't really take that manly, strict, you know, closed fist said, approach. Sir, but that when that failed, at she... At some point, she had to do tough love. And right. TLC. Yeah, that's that's what I think. So she started with a soft love, but then she realized, no man, this this guy has got, eh? gone to the streets. Yes, um, Mo eh? Moya, 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 Lee. Lee. Moya Lee, sorry. I think she had to do this because she real growing up, she realized that he needed a father figure in his life. So she tried to be that father figure. But what father figure did he eventually gravitate toward? The one that gave him the submachine gun, sir. Yes, sir. Sir, and I do believe that the lack of parental, of male parental figure in his life may have led to this because in a sense, it looks like he was very desperate for a, a male role in his life and he just picked the wrong person to admire or gravitate to. Based on what Eve is saying, I think she's right because... First, she said she raised him twice, once the mother, then as a father. But obviously, she, she, being a father figure in his life, did not work out. Then she, he, he go and said, he said, she, she go and said, she go on and said, he says you are like a father to him, which means he never have a father figure. So he had to go outside to look for a father figure, which him find the person I work for, the employer, as a father figure. But the mother just never, the mother didn't like the father figure he took up. That's right. Because he chose to admire the wrong person. Because we both know that a real father figure or a good father figure would not have given their son a machine gun. Granted, but he's not seeing it as that. And the employer is probably telling him that it's for his good. It's probably to protect him. So he's saying that this person is looking out for me when in reality, that person is probably putting him to his death. 
And the mother is realizing that that is completely out of her control because she's feeling that she failed as a parent and there's nothing more she can do at this point. There's nothing more she can do at this point but plan for funeral. In it's addition coming. to his statement, it's like the employer was taking up on his innocence because he don't really have that father figure to tell him that what he's doing was wrong. Yeah, that's what I took from that. Yeah, all, all, all good good perspectives on these four lines. And we, we see that the, the poem looks quite a lot on parenting, even on the, the limitations of a parent. You know, even when you have the best plans, you have, you have a good parenting style, you do your best. At the end of the day, the child will eventually choose and determine, you know, what path they take in life. So when we say, when we say, go on, yes, Colin, coming in. Sorry, just to add to that as well, I think that the mother also feels um, very guilty as well. Um, not only is she losing her son or she thinks she's going to lose her son, but being the single parent or who he originally relied on and maybe her feeling that she wasn't as strict. And as we said, again, the raised him twice, the then um, as a father with a strict, probably she would feel responsible that he maybe like got away from her and she didn't have the control over him. So then she would blame herself for if he had died. And, you know, as you mentioned that, I am just seeing in my mind some possible um, essay questions that might, that might use this poem on, on the exam. Uh, the essay questions I like to ask about, so we'll be just talking a little bit about possible essay questions as we touch on the poems, because you will be writing an essay, of course. Um, some poems like, some questions like to focus on emotions. For example, feelings of hopelessness. You know, in two poems, uh, in, in these two poems, speakers feel hopeless and you need to write an essay about hopelessness. We see here that the mother has lost hope by the last couple of stanzas. Um, a, a question might ask about guilt. Choose two poems in which speakers feel uh, guilty towards something. We, we, Jordan just mentioned that the mother feels guilty because you know, she feels as if she failed her son. Right. What what other types of questions might we might we be able to answer using this point? Parenthood. When we look at this point, we look at little boy crying. We look at my parents. You know, challenges of parenthood. Cisse likes these kinds of questions. But when we're writing the essay, we have to look not only at the themes but on the devices. So let's take a look at some devices. What are some interesting devices that jump out at you from this point? Diction. Diction, explain, the, uh, Dev, Ronaldo, what kind of diction? Um, not diction, sorry, biblical allusion. Biblical allusion, so tell me about the biblical allusion. So um, the poet compares her son with Judas Iscariot's mother and the thief on the left-hand side of the cross. And what, you have to comment on the effect of the device. So if you were given this question in the exam, how would you comment on the effect of the biblical allusion? What does that allusion do in the poem? Sir, um, the allusion compares her grief to that of um, King David. So I believe that the biblical allusion helps to emphasize the grief that the mother is experiencing towards an event that hasn't yet taken place, which is the death of her son. I think she used biblical allusion to like not imply that the son has died already, but like she gave an example of David's son who has died. So it's leading up to that. It's so she used, so even so she used that phrase. It's a foreshadow what going to happen to biblical allusion to foreshadow what going to happen to the son. Yes, that's that's right. Amelia Basically. came in. Yes. Eve, were you finished? <laughs> yes, I was finished. All right. All right. Pretty good. So I, don't think, I see. I don't um, think that, um, all right, Joel, Joel, go ahead. And, and then mm -hmm. go ahead, Joel. I don't think that I don't think that the biblical illusion is emphasis. I think it's more of it, it just perfectly encapsulates the situation that the sun is in instead of being emphasis, you know, like it's like one of the few ways you can actually describe the situation in like two sentences, you know? It's not really emphasis, it's more, I don't know, just 
definition, like giving a situation. It's more, it's more to yeah. like help you understand what is going to happen because nothing here says that he's going to die because she can buy the black cloth and it turns out that he didn't die. But the fact that she used reference to Davidson who died made it implies that he eventually died or eventually. she thinks that he's yeah. going to die. Yeah, it's more symbolic yeah. than emphasis. It's more symbolic. Yeah. But uh, I, I think it's both. Saw... <laughs> yes, go ahead, go ahead. Tessa. Oh yeah, I, I in the in the chat I saw but Emery um had a point I wanted to support um about um to show that she eventually will be betrayed. So the theme of betrayal, that's very important. And then Brown and Blair um had a show an acceptance. So in essence, she's at peace, which is what Absalom is about, and that she's prepared um, to to accept what happened with her son. I also wanted to add this: this um, when you're talking about themes, um, love and the undying love of a mother is captured by Absalom because if we remember, David did grieve despite what his son had um, done to him. So, in many respects, that Absalom is so crucial in the poem to capture the betrayal, the, the notion of acceptance, the foreshadowing of the death or the, or the allusion to the death, I heard that as well, and the undying love of a mother for her son. Well put. And as, as we go forward in the meeting, um, keep an eye out on the chat. I can't read all the messages here because there are, there are many. Yeah, if I see some oh. things, I'll tell you. <laughs> yeah, there are some interesting ideas coming out in the chat also. Um, I saw something from Jade. Absalom, Absalom means father of peace. Well, that's interesting. And we see some scriptures we can even look at. So I think you. that um, when it comes to undying love, stanza, stanza five itself is about undying love since it's about the mother praying and weeping for her son. That's undying love. Because like if she didn't have that, she would just accept it right away. All right, let's, let's, let's take a look at the last word of the point because we seem to be focused on, Ab, on, on Absalom. But what is interesting about Absalom is, and as Amory said in the chat, it tells the readers that eventually she will be betrayed. Absalom, his intention was to betray David, wasn't it? To kill, to, to betray his father. So does the woman feel betrayed by her son or by the man or by both? What is the betrayal in the poem about? Because basically she's saying that she tried her best to grow him both as a mother and a father and he still she tried to give him the best examples basically and he still went astray to find other father figure and which has a bad influence on him so it, basically she has say all our teachings them go down the drain all what she tried to teach him Give him wow. that father figure, give him the example, sure. give him that role model to look up to. All of that has failed because he still went astray. Sir. Sounds good. Yes, um, Brown coming in. Brown and All right, here. sir. Um, let me try to make a point, sir. Um, where the betrayal comes in, sir, it could be the fact that even though she was poor and not in a very good financial situation, sir, instead of aborting the child, sir, she saw it as hope and still had the child and tried to grow it, grew him as best as she could. And she gave, he, the child gave, gave it all up for some father figure that wasn't even there. That's my views on it, sir. That's, that's a critical point. Look at stanza two. She carried him like the poor carry hope, hope he get a break or a visa, hope one child go through and remember you. So she, she really felt as if, you know, this, this boy, he, he, I didn't deserve to be treated like this by my son. I, I did everything I could. And eventually the son was an investment for her. We know that some, some people consider their children to be their pension, <laughs> you know, like, you Sir, know, your view is that yes, Devani, Ronaldo. Saying that reveal in stanza three when she said she raised him twice, once as a mother, then as a father, set no ceiling on what he could be doctor, Earth healer, pilot take wings. That was her investment in his son. She had expectations, but obviously 
she she got a different result than what she expected so therefore she was betrayed very good yes yes brown all of her teachings like she expected him to be something good in life now she's realizing that he he has ruined his future and there's nothing that she can do about it so she feels betrayed because she expected him to be of a sense to life she expected him to be a doctor a lawyer a pilot so she could feel proud of him yes i'm sorry and she she got let down eventually because instead he everybody knows there's if you even if the firearm is legal more unlikely something is going to happen where you're as i quoted live by the gun die by the gun she she basically feeling like she failed as a parent because she had such high hopes for him by the way guys as uh, as much as we know the ideas and the poems try to know a few of the lines word by word so when you're in, in the exam you can actually quote you know when i talk about hopelessness i can actually put in quotation marks the speaker claims she is prepared she's done so it's good when you're able to to lift direct words from the text because it shows CSEC or oh, the student actually knows the poem deeply. So if there are 20 poems, it's going to be hard to know lines from all 20 poems, but this is what we need to do. And we see Brandon coming in, in the chat. She carried him full term tied up under her heart. That's a metaphor, of course, that as he explains, shows how, how she really had that hope and love and expectation for him. All right. Um, before we move on to another poem, are there any difficult lines or words that you would want us to iron out? Anything tricky about this poem that you still can't quite get your head around? Sir, stanza five. Stanza five. Okay, so she has no power over you and this at the level of earth. That's okay, stanza that... five, line six. Line six. She reads Psalms for you. Who is you referring to? Wow, that's a good question. Uh, who... I think it refers to the, the, the man who has employed the woman's son because she's talking kind of to that man. So reading Psalms for a person, I believe this, this could have two meanings. You know, if, if somebody says they're reading Psalms, so it could almost be that they're using the power of God to, to rebuke you, you know, put a curse upon your life. Sir, I, it, I think that is yes, wrong if, because the following, the following sentence above that says that our prayers and a mother's tears, which means that she's basically praying and praying and reading her Bible for the son, because mm. she's saying that a mother's tears, which means that she a, she a cry and she a, and she a pray, same come off of the truck where I'm dip on, because she realizes that there's nothing she can do and it's out of her control. So it's, she's going to God. She's yeah, so going to God asking for sir, help to yeah. guide him. Sir, I have an opinion. I, I, right, just, just a minute. I, I'll take I'll take Jade and then Tessa. But let me just okay. comment on what Eve just said. Um, you're going into the, the double meaning that I spoke of. Because in one perspective, you could say that she's reading Psalms for the employer, meaning, you know, God will get you back. God will protect my son and, and go after you. But wait, but if it, you read it could the also be, line above it, you know, it, mm -hmm. one says that she says Psalms for him. And then it says that she's re she reads Psalms for you, which means that basically it's the both of them. So she says it for one and reads it for the other, because that's what it's stating right there. I think I can tell actually. I think I can tell because think about this. You think about this. Well, okay, go ahead. She she <laughs> always <laughs> refers to the star <laughs> as you. Oh, no. yes, uh, wait, wait, wait. No, 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 can't all speak at once. <laughs> all right. Um uh, Tessa, go on and then Gerald you know, comes after. Okay, so uh, you said I well, I agree. First of all, I wanted to just agree with you that the Psalms for the you, the you is the employer, and it's Psalms of retribution. Because you see, the Bible, and I think there might be some another message here in terms of the duality or purpose of the Bible. There's so much that you can get from the Bible that is, in a sense, done for good purposes, as opposed to the you can get um, Psalms that 
speak to rebuking or you know calling for some level of retribution you know that kind of thing so and that's how i see it that clearly she will um say the psalms for for the son but there she can also find psalms in the bible that will punish the employer for what he is is doing to her son and that you can say the same thing for she weeps for his soul her eye water covers you so the tears are for the um in a sense to salvation for the for her son but hoping that by crying she can draw some level of emotion and and guilt um from the from the employer and have him feel some level of repentance now going to the point about the hymn if you notice um anytime she references the son there's the pronoun him so i'm just assuming that the, she says psalms for him is the son and the you is the employer all right uh before anyone else jumps in let, let me just uh, reinforce what tessa just said look at how uh, campbell just just a minute i know campbell wants to come in look at how him and you are used uh Okay, she has no power over you. We're, let's say we're not sure who this you is. Fine. Let's go to a line where we can be sure. She say, she weeps for his soul. She's not weeping for the, the employer's soul. She doesn't care about the employer's soul. So this his must be or might be the son. So the his or the him could be the son. She says Psalms for the son. So she's saying the Psalms for the son, but she's reading the Psalms. For you, who, who is the you? The employer, perhaps. The employer. And her eye water covers who? The employer. So her no, tears. No, sir. I think the eye water covers her son. So, so we jump no, from him no, to you. It's the employer. <laughs> it is the oh. employer. Listen, um, jumping in here. Tears of when, when Jamaica, when, when, when in Jamaica we talk about um. I water the player. That's what they're talking about. You know, her eye water covers you. Yes. When Jamaican say read a psalm for you, that is what. So it's it's yes. it's pray. Yeah. She's praying for both, but different tones. All so right. The, the, um, the the son gets the reading, um, but uh, say get the saying of the psalm. Sorry, but the employer, the gunman, gets the reading. Me go read a psalm for you. That right. is how it's done. Uh, and, before, the, uh, and the eye water defiant. So the, she's like she's cursing one day to the, 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 um, the gunman. And yes. she is pleading for her son. Uh, before so Gerald speaks, b- before Gerald or David speaks, I'm going to give you a chance. But l- listen to what um, D- Davis just, just, just said. If you're not from Jamaica, you might not have, you, you might not be familiar. Or I guess you guys are very young, so you might still not be familiar, even from Jamaica. With, Sir, with, with, I am with, with from that. Jamaica. And I am familiar with the <laughs> saying because it's a very strong saying where the, a mother's tears is very powerful. Like, I have witnessed it, but like when a mother like literally cries and prays for her, is her, her child, it's a different type of prayer. All so, right, so if she did a uh, cry and a prayer for him in a sir, I want peace of prayer she put on, you know. But who is she yes, praying no, for? Who who She's is her eye water for, covering? So, so um, if, so I think water, there's like a sir. So there's like a lot of evidence for she it. She knows that the son will eventually die. She's still trying to pray for him to cover him and guide him, regardless of the fact that he's going to die. All right, let's see what Gerald thinks. Thank you, Eve. Gerald, what were you saying? So there's like a, like massive amounts of evidence that like. I was I was about to say what you had said because um there's like massive amounts of evidence that the hymn is the son because in each and every stanza there is him which references the the son you know like in stanza one like in stanza one and stanza two she carried him like the poor she raised him twice once as a mother and it's only then in like stanza three when it said he is working for you and like also let's look at the title it's it clearly says the woman speaks to the man who has employed the son so like. It's in the title, so like, yeah. Yeah, I think I think Gerald has, has come up with so much evidence there that the and him, also like mm-hmm. the structure. And you also, can look at the structure and know who is who. Yeah. And also like the I before I was thinking like the him is the the employer because I not Jamaican but like when I read the Bible I use when people say a psalm. 
people saying and reading a psalm is different. You know how praying is silence. People pray for other people in silence, you know, but people just curse other people, like like curse loudly at them. So when I see when I see say psalm, I think of say psalm I like to curse him, you know. And when they read psalm, it's a for prayer. But like you know, but still the evidence um clearly says that him is a son. Any closing thoughts? We have to jump to another poem. <laughs> Anything else? Um, um, sir, over the pool that I water is who her tears cover. I think her tears are for the employer because she says, because it narrates, she weeps for his soul, her eye water covers you. She weeps for her son. She mourns or she's sad over what is happening to him and what she's witnessing. But her tears are supposed to be guilting the employer. Her Perfect. tears cover you. It is his fault. Perfectly said, Bermina. These tears are supposed to, to really encapsulate his guilt, his implication in her son's demise. So the son has gone down this path, but guess what? This, this is on you. His blood is on your shoulder. And so the woman's tears is really guilting the employer in this way.